Thank you. All right, we just go ahead and go. Okay. Hi everyone, can you see my screen? All right, we just go ahead. And, yeah, can you see my screen? Can you still hear me? Can you see oh, my no, screen? No, we can't see the screen yet. We can't yeah. see a screen. Can you see my no. screen? Okay. All right. No, we can't. Can you see my screen? So there is. Thing. Can you still hear me? Can you see oh, my no, screen? No, we can't see the screen yet. We can't yeah. see it. One sec. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to Enrique, who is joining us all the way from Arizona. And it's such a great delight to invite you to my HR Story One Year Anniversary Live Series. The book, My HR Story, which is a collection of amazing stories of 56 HR professionals in Nigeria, was put together last year and was unveiled on the 25th of January last year. So tomorrow is going to make it one year, but it's also important that we acknowledge and celebrate how far we have come impacting lives in the last one year. There have been lots and lots of testimonies of how the book had impacted people's career, it's impacted the decisions that they've made in their career. And today is just only to, one, be grateful for how far we have come, and at the same time, um, also look at what are the other opportunities for us for the next level. And we are so happy to have an amazing global personality join us today. So if you might ask me, what are you looking forward to achieve today? It's just to learn. Um, basically the life series offers a platform where we learn having fun, hearing the stories of other people, because research has, research has shown that when you tell stories, authentic stories, you connect more with people, people can relate more to stories and storytelling is really powerful. It's a tool that evokes connection and emotion and it's also a tool that spur actions. So when you share a story with someone, that person can relate with it and they can remember it. I mean, there's, we are in a world now where there's a lot of information out there. And one of the things that I've thought would help us retain more information is when we hear life lessons, career lessons. And from there, we can, we can also chart our, our own path. So welcome once again to our eighth edition, but it's also our one year anniversary. And today's celebration is not just about me, it's about the fact that a, a collection of HR professionals bought into the vision, 56 of us, we have some of them on the call today. Um, Twin Smile stories in there, Taiwo, a couple of other people whose story, who st stories are in there. Thank you so much. I mean, we all made this happen. It's not just only putting our story out there, but also using our story as transformational tool for younger professionals. And today we would also hear from them as well. We, we, we've had a couple of reviews, which I've been posting on social media in terms of the impact that has, it has had in, in the life of, of younger ones. So. Today, we are going to have another exciting learning time. Usually it's not about making presentation, but it's just about having that conversation, just talking. And it's not just what we've read somewhere, but sharing from our own individual experiences so that we can also help other people to learn from our, ex from our experience. Today, we will we'll have Enrique join us shortly where it's going to be talking about 
you know, the, so, so many things that he's done. I mean, I particularly read his profile and I was wild and I've seen a couple of things that he's done. But before I, before we, we invite a um, speaker on, on virtual stage this afternoon, I like us to take us down the memory lane of when we unveiled my HR storybook on the 25th of January, 2020. It's important for us to reflect and you know, cast our minds back to that very beautiful day when this vision was unveiled. And afterwards, then we'll hear from our younger ones. We'll, we'll have someone who is a mentee here also join us and share his reviews with us. So sit back, relax, and let us learn. Quickly, I'll play the very short uh, video on the day the book was launched. Thank you. Human resources for profession has now been simplified for budding practitioners, a book that deploys the literary technique of storytelling with the basis of mentorship that was unveiled in Lagos to enhance employability among the young population. Ola Awako. They are professionals from the human resources community. Their aim is to celebrate one of them who has just put pen to paper to produce a collection of stories that are made out of the address. Some of the factors have to be responsible for the prevalence of youth unemployment in Nigeria is lack of mentorship. This book is also has to be more proactive in encouraging the more than 60% of the population to be self-productive. It gives you perspectives of other people who have been through that path, who have traveled that path, and how they've made a success of the profession. 160 pages of educational storylines also touches on leadership, recruitment, training, Building a career in the human resources profession is made easy with this book, and the author believes it will enhance employability among many youth in Nigeria and beyond. Ola Awa, CBC News, Vegas. Thank you. So on this note, I'd like to call on a young professional, Damilare Babalola, to come and talk to us about the from the mentee's angle, what does mentorship mean to him? And he's also read the book to also share his review of the book as well. Okay. Uh, I'm like, I'm so great. Yes, ma. Good Go afternoon, ahead. Kutlara. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to share my view of mentorship. So to me, mentorship is first a relationship within two persons. And mentorship has to do basically with um, sharing of knowledge and experience amidst two persons. And there are different kinds of mentorship. We have a uh, senior mentor and a peer mentor. But when it has to do with a senior mentor, 
it has to do with uh, MNT, who is ready to listen and also learn from the mentor, even beyond what is being said. Basically, also having to observe the mentor, look at what they do, how they do it, and learning to make sure that he doesn't fall where the mentor has fallen. Sorry. Hi, Damilari. We can't hear you. Hello. Hello, Damilari. Hello, we can't hear you, Damilari. Hi, I'm Larry. Can you see hear me? Uh oh, we can't hear you. Is it better now? Yes, a lot better. Maybe. You lost a bit. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> No, I'm using them too. Okay, so I said mentorship. <laughs> so mentorship is um, in relation. It's a okay, so we can't hear you again. We can't hear you. Wow. Wow. MTN, MTN okay, it's better. Day. It's better now. <laughs> It's better now. Yes. Okay, I'm very sorry about the glitches. That's fine. Please okay. go ahead. So I said mentorship is uh, mentorship is a relationship within two persons, and they are often regarded to as mentors and mentees. A mentor can be a senior mentor can be a peer mentor, but laying emphasis on a senior mentor, a senior mentor is somebody who you get to learn from, somebody who has treaded the path you want to tread, or who is currently representing what you want to be known for, who is known for what you want to be known for, and is a platform of sharing of knowledge and experience. So it has to be somebody. <laughs> Okay. All right. Are, are you done, Dam Larry? Do I lost you for a bit? Are you done? Okay. Can you can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry about my empty network. I'm really sorry about it. It's it's, it's okay. cutting me off unusually. <laughs> Okay, okay, so can, like we, I was can saying we have that, your review of the book? Yes. Can we have your review of the book? I mean, you the read book, the book. I learned, yes. The book was actually one that opened me up to my blind spot. It showed me some certain things that I needed to pay more attention to about my career. And it taught me so many, it gave me so many insights that even without being an HR professional, there are insights and knowledge you can get from the book that will be very much useful to you regardless of your choice of career. So I received so much insight, it opened up to, your, to my blind spot. And I mean, it was literally a virtual communication of mentorship and knowledge sharing that I had to start penning down since outside of the book. So it was really an eye opener for me. And I've been exploring so many things I learned and I'm still in the process of exploring more of the things I've encountered through the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Damlari. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. So on this note, I'll read out the profile of our guest speaker today. And afterwards, he will come on to the virtual stage. Erike is an HR tech and future of work expert and keynote speaker and founder of Hacking HR, a global learning community at the intersection of future of work, technology, business, and organizations, with thousands of members all over the world. Enrique is one of the top 100 HR global influencers. He came to the United States from Venezuela 
as a Fulbright Scholar. Prior to coming to the US, Enrique was the CEO at a management consulting organization, a firm specialized in human resources. Before he left the management consulting role, Enrique worked in the telecommunications sector as a senior project engineer for Telefonica. He is also the co-founder of Cotopaxi, a recruitment platform um, focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. Enrique is a guest author in several blogs, and he blogs a lot of, about innovation, management, and human resources. Most recently, Enrique worked as the advisor to the chief human resources officer at the Inter-American Development Bank. Enrique has over 20 years of experience and is an electronic engineer with an executive master's in public administrations from Maxwell School. He is the founder of Hacking HR, a global community focused on creating the best HR that ever existed. It is focused on building a global HR community of change makers willing to transform HR and informing the community of the latest trends at the intersection of the future of work, technology, and HR. So Enrique has, has run Hacking HR for a couple of years now. I've, I've had to speak at the conference. This is my third consecutive year going. And for me, one thing that stood out for me in that conference is how he's able to leverage on technology to bring together thousands of professionals across the world. This year's conference, Enrique has 530 confirmed speakers across the world. Over 13,000 participants have registered for Hacking HR Conference 2021. And the, this year's conference is focusing on innovation and the future of work. It's a global online conference. Um, I'm really humbled. When I see Enrique talk, he talks so passionate about human resources and he's devoted so much of his time to ensure that he's building world-class change agents. I mean, I, I was chatting with a couple of people within my community this year and I said to them, HR is no longer HR. We are, we are, like, we, we, we are transformative change agents, enabling our business success through our talent. And for me, it's important that we, we also learn from a global perspective, you know, what is going on out there? How do they also experience the kind of issues we have in the workplace that we all experience locally here? What are the insights and knowledge that we can get from that global perspective? And I am humbled and honored to have Enrique Rubio join us today. It's 7 a.m. He's joining us all the way from Arizona. He had to wake up very early on a Sunday morning to be part of the community today with us, and we are really grateful for that. Erike, can we have you on the virtual podium? Can we put our Hello. hands together? Hi. Can we Hi see there. You? Yes. Oh, Hi. great. Hi, awesome. Lara. How are you? Very, very well. Glad to see you. Glad to have you join us. So, Erike, the floor is yours. Typically, it's a live session. People are going to be asking you questions. And I'll, I'll be reading out the questions from the questions that they post in the chat box. But I'd like to hear a bit of your career journey. How has it been? I mean, you've had to move countries. You've had to change career. I mean, transitioning from engineering to human resources. So it would be nice to hear your story in, 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 in within just five, 10 minutes, just walk us through your career journey. How's it been for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, Lara, thank you so much for inviting me. And hello, everybody. It's good to uh, meet you all online. And I hope you are all, of course, staying well and safe, which is, I guess, the most important thing these days, uh, you know, our, our personal and our family safety and, and health. So, so good to be here sharing some, some ideas, some thoughts with you about, about HR, and what I consider to be our incredible future if we seize the opportunities. Uh, just quickly about my career, I, I started my work as an electronic engineer. So I am, I'm an engineer and I, I worked 
many years in the telecommunications sector. And it was um, it was a fantastic experience, to be honest. I, I don't I, I think that one of the one of the most valuable things that has worked the best for me is being an engineer in HR. And, and I don't mean to say that just because being an engineer makes me a better HR person. I mean to say that by by because doing something else and then moving into HR makes you a better HR professional. That's There's no doubt about that. The same thing works the other way around. If you are an engineer that works in HR and then com, com, comes back to engineering, you're going to be a much better engineer than if you had just stayed doing the same thing for ever, basically. So I'm an engineer. I transitioned into the world of HR about 12 years ago uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because I, I, at the end of my career as an engineer, I was doing technical sales. And I didn't like doing sales that much, but I love the relationship with people. I love talking to people and you know hearing from their needs and try to offer them something that worked for them. So I see somebody who is a chemical engineer. By the way, I sucked a chemical in, a, a, a chemistry in a school. I had to take a few classes. I, I, I sucked. Um, uh, so kudos to you for uh, for managing the the chemistry uh, of all this uh, of all the engineering. Uh, so uh, a couple of experiences then made me move it in, into HR. The one of liking to work with people. And the second one is I was fired from a job. This was about 12 years ago. I was fired from the job and, uh, you know, in a very unfair kind of way. And the HR people in that company didn't do anything. So I was so pissed at the fact that I was doing my job. I was a great performer and I still was fired. You know, I was fired because I was doing a side gig and the person of the company got really upset at me because I was having a side gig. Imagine that, you know, how stupid that is. But the fact is that the combination of me liking to work with people and having this a painful negative experience in, in my career made me think, you know what? I want to move into the world of HR. I want to see... Uh, how how people work in here. And I also want to see if we can do it better, you know, if we can create a better HR. So from there, I transitioned into the consulting space, then into the corporate world. And last year, in 2019, at the end of 2019, I left my full-time corporate job to be full-time with Hacking HR. It's been quite a journey because, well, you know, um, I love HR, but we don't pay the bills just by loving HR. You know, we got to um, make, sure, make sure that it works financially. <laughs> so, you know, last year was very hard on everybody, including financially for hacking HR. But I continue to be very, um, very, uh, not only passionate, but I, I have high hopes about, about HR. And I know that with Lara, we're going to be talking about a lot, of, a lot of things today. But that's my career. That's, uh, that's, that's what I've done engineer. Now I am uh, in HR and, and I'm loving it. You know, I think we have, I think we have the most extraordinary opportunity of any other function, to be honest. And I say this coming from a different background from just HR. So anyway, that's a little bit about my career. Just a couple of other things. I'm, I, I am originally from Venezuela. Now I live in the United States. I live in the state of Arizona. Um, we have a snowstorm going on right now. So you guys are probably a little bit warmer than, than it is in here. And um, so that's me. So Lara, turning it over back to you. you, you yeah. Wow, that, that was so interesting. Engineering to HR, that's good. I, I think I love the fact where you mentioned that even though we're in HR and we love HR, we are, some of us are really so passionate about HR. There's a business part of HR because just loving HR does not just pay the bills. Yeah. <laughs> and, I th and I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, so my question to you would be, transitioning from engineering, even though you did not have any background in HR, what you did discover was your passion for people, mm. relating with people, helping to solve problems. What transferable skill did you take from engineering to HR? And what are those learnings from your background in engineering that you still believe helps you in your HR career, even up to today? It would be nice to understand where the linkage is for you in terms of skills from engineering yeah. to HR. Sure. Yeah, I know that, that is a wonderful question. Um, let, let me begin by saying this. Uh, that there are some jobs for which you don't necessarily, I mean, it would be ideal, but you don't necessarily have to have a passion 
about working for or with people. Uh, you know, if you if you work in sales, you gotta be a passion. You gotta have a passion of working with people. But if you work like in a you know doing some lab work or something, maybe you love people, but you don't necessarily have to love working for people or working to serve others to do your job, right? I mean, it would be ideal, but that's not necessary. In the HR world, you have to be passionate about working for people. And the reason why I say that is because even though we end up running a lot of transactions and a lot of administration and all the blah, 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 like what I call the boring side of HR, we have to do the boring side of HR. We still have to do it, keeping in mind that we do it because we're serving others. That to me is the underlying principle of the work that we do in HR. If you are not caught to serve others and see yourself as a server to others, then you may be great at the transaction, but that doesn't make you a great HR professional. It makes you great in the transaction, but that's not the real HR that we that we want to see in the world. So the first thing here is you got to be very passionate about working for people and serving them, literally serving them because that's the work that we do in HR. Now, in terms of what I bring or what I brought from engineering into HR, I think to me, it's mostly I can I can boil, boil it all down to mindset. You know, in engineering, we think so differently about processes, how to tackle problems, uh, you know, experimentation, agility. A lot of a lot of ideas that you don't see often in the world of HR. So let me let me give you one example of this. If you are an engineer and you are doing something in engineering and you come up with a problem, you you won't you follow some processes, but you are trying to be less bureaucratic and more agile and more inclined to experiment with potential solutions, right? To resolve that problem. And you try to go fast, you know, testing ideas, seeing what works, learning from the process. And if something doesn't work, you learn from it and then you move on to the next po possible solution. And that's how you go until you, you know, you get to where you want to be. In addition to that, in engineering, because the things that engineers do are generally complex, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't see necessarily a problem for its full complexity, but you try to break it down into, into pieces that you can actually, you know, humanly and, and mentally and professionally manage. This is not true for the world of HR. In the world of HR, it seems that it's all about the process. It seems that if something happens, it is like, you know, we cannot resolve that one thing because it is tied to all another set of stuff that we... We, we, we haven't had the ability to, to break down those problems and, you know, and focus on individual solutions that contribute to making the, the overall situation better. So I think, once again, to me, it is this mindset of how to resolve problems, experimenting with ideas, um, you know, being more agile, being more creative, and perhaps sometimes being a little bit more uh, fearless, you know, that's something that in HR is not really common, you know, and, and by the way, I'm not blaming any of you. Um, uh, and in general, I'm not necessarily blaming any HR professional for this to be this way. It is like, uh, you know, imagine, uh, you know, uh, somebody telling you for, you know, 100 years that don't take any risk, don't innovate, don't be creative. We want you to come here, pay people, hire them, fire them, and that's pretty much all you do. And then they tell you that for 100 years. And then one day, out of the blue, they tell, they're telling you, oh, Enrique, now you have to be creative. Now you have to innovate. Now you got to take risk. Now you, you got to be creative. After 100 years telling you not to do those things. So to, to move away from a, from a mindset that was created in the HR space for a long period of time to a new mindset, that takes time. But at least me coming from the engineering side, I already come from somewhat of that mindset because that's how we operate in the world of engineering. So that's, uh, that's in a nutshell, Lara, what, uh, you know, some of the, the relationship in there. Fantastic, thank you. So I have a question for you from Timmy Tope. Speaking about being financially stable, how are you able to run a free hacking HR conference worldwide? 
Would it always be free? So we want to get some strategy um, <laughs> behind your hacking HR vision. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is what I believe in. And, and I wish you were, you know, you were able to see inside my head to know that I'm telling you, uh, that I'm genuinely telling you what I, what I believe. Uh, I've been to many conferences, what I've had to pay to register for the conference. So the conference is making money out of the sponsors. The conference is making money out of paying people. And generally, at least before COVID, 99.9% of all the conferences were in person, meaning that you also had to pay to go there. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go to any of these conferences, first of all, it was a very limited amount of people to begin with because of physical space. But if, even if there was no physical bound, like physical uh, limitation to participate in the conference, most people don't have the money to pay to register for that one conference or to travel to go to, go to the conference. So what I was seeing is we are creating all these barriers you know, for HR people to join these incredible communities of speakers to learn from them and, and whatnot. Uh, so we are already excluding people just uh, by by you know by putting a price on on the um, on the registration and by making it difficult for them to participate because they have to travel. Uh, so so that's that's uh, that's one piece. And the other piece is that whenever I would go to a conference, I would generally see always kind of the same people, right? It is like wait a second, I saw you in the conference three months ago, like you know, and and then the next one is like I saw you in the conference last year. So it's the same people all the time, and I was thinking when I put the first big conference, we do like about 150 events every year. Our big conference, we're doing it in March. We did the first big one in March of last year. I started organizing it in November of 2019 and it was always going to be online and it was always going to be free even before COVID. Because to me, the principle here is or was and continues to be there are 12 million HR professionals in the world about that. And I don't think there are more than say, you know, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being very generous here. Let's say that there are 200,000 of all of them participating in some kind of conference going on globally. So that means that we are tackling, you know, less than 1% of all the people, maybe one or 2% of all the people in HR in the world with this knowledge. And I said, you know what, this, this, is, this model is broken. We can't continue doing things in this, in this way. So I decided to put the conference for free and online. It will always be for free and it will always be online. I need to make the money and I got to be, you know, uh, you know, clear with this. So I need to bring sponsors. Uh, this year, I try to bring a lot of sponsors. And uh, this is me being very authentic, by the way. I received a lot of no's. And this is the reason because they, <laughs> it's funny, you know, they have been told something by other conferences that I know they won't get out of those conferences. They, they have been told some promises <clears throat> that when the sponsor tells me, Enrique, you're not giving me this, but this other conference is giving it to me, I'm thinking, that's not, they are not giving that to you. That's, 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 not, that's not true. I am a, I'm a conference organizer, right? So I'm learning a lot on how to bring, on how to better design the, the, the underlying fundamentals of the conference so that I can cater to the sponsors as well. But I, you know, as long as I can continue doing this, Hacking HR, that one conference would be, uh, would be for free because I, I want to continue decreasing or eliminating the barriers from people to learn from the best speakers in the world. Um, so we have the conference this year, as you know, I hope you all signed up. And, uh, and I'm hoping that the one next year is going to be even bigger and even better. It's always, you know, learning process, but that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it's a, it's, it's a combination of passion, but also inclusion. You know, the fact that, yeah. um, you know, we can still make the money, but we don't have to charge people for this. You know, we can find the money somewhere else. Wow. Enrique, that is really deep. I mean, when you, when you mentioned the fact that you had a vision and your vision was very clear, your vision was also birthed out of an obstacle, a barrier that you've also observed with regards to getting more people to learn. Mm -hmm. And from there, you also had to create your own vision to make an impact. I mean, you, you, you're up country where you are, but you're not just limiting your thinking to just your location. You're thinking of the entire world. Yeah. I mean, you're thinking of impact across borders. And for me, that is really, really huge. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
And I think as HR by, by the way, Lara, sorry, Lara, Lara I want to say this. I please forgive forgive me oh, for interrupting you. It's okay. I, I, forgive me for that. I just want to say one thing. The top three countries sign up for the conference: the United States, Canada. Guess which is the third one? Tell me. Nigeria. Nigeria. Woo! I thought third I one is Nigeria. So I'm very proud Ooh. that. I hear you are interacting with Nigeria live. All the fellow, your fellow citizens and nature professionals from the Nigerian community, you know, are 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 uh, are joining the conference. So please continue to tell them, uh, Lara. Yeah. Please forgive me for having interrupted no, no, you. No, it's okay. No, I mean, you, you, you were, it was an exciting news that you had to share with us. And in Nigeria, we are honored to have a lot of senior professionals who are who really care for the younger ones. Yeah. I mean, economically, it can be tough out here. But regardless of that, we are also still focused on helping one another grow, become better. And I think that so everyone on the call, wow, kudos to everyone. So that does not for me, it's for every professional in Nigeria here. Thank you, thank you HR people. Okay, so that takes me to my next question on receiving no's. So you mentioned that while you were also seeking for sponsorship, a couple you got a lot of no's. And for me, I've always had to experience no's. I mean, when I was even putting together the stories in my HR storybook, I saw the vision to, I mean, almost a hundred HR professionals, 56 people came back. So which meant I got about 50% no's. People came back and said, no, I'm too busy. I don't have time for this. What is this all about? Da, 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 da. You know, but a lot of times when young people, when young people, young people go for interviews and they get no's, they, they, they are quick to get heartbroken. Yeah. And even we as HR professionals, sometimes you have ideas that can move your business forward and you yeah. share it with your stakeholders or with management and then they tell you, no, this would not work. Yeah. So what, what, how did you help yourself anytime you get no how are you able to motivate yourself regardless of that obstruction with the request that you've made out because as humans once you get no it can be very demotivating yeah so how are you able to motivate yourself when you receive no's let, let me let me begin by sharing this this true story um for the conference that we have this march coming up in six weeks we have a little over 500 speakers confirmed. That, can anybody guess how many people I actually invited to speak at the conference? Just put the number in the chat. Just, just take a okay, guess. Guys, put the number in the chat. Don't guess. Invited to speak at the conference. Just put out, just, you know, any number that comes to mind. Oh, come on. It can be 20. <laughs> if I have already 500. 1,002. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hmm. All right. I invited more than 5,000 people <gasps> to come to speak at the event. And I have 500 confirmed. More than 5,000 people. 000. That wow. is, imagine if it takes me only one minute inviting one person, which is not true because I have to first screen them and, and see that they meet the wow. qualifications that we want for the event. That is at least 5,000 minutes dedicated only to sending out emails or messages and whatnot. I have 500 confirmed. If I have gotten all yeses, I would have 5,000 speakers at the event, but I don't have 5,000 speakers at the event. <laughs> I got a lot of, <laughs> I got a lot of no's. I got a lot of no responses. Um, and, you know, sometimes the people that don't respond, they, they miss the email or my email went to spam or they didn't see the message and it's okay. Sometimes the no's are like, Enrique, this is great, but, you know, I, I'm not available that week, you know, count me for next year. Uh, and there are some people that say no uh, in a different way, uh, which is the, the heartbreaking one. Some no's are, they, they feel, maybe, maybe they don't put it in words, but you know, you know, when you've been doing this for a while, you know, you know what a message means, right? Um, those no's mean something like, um, um, you know, something along the lines of, you know, I don't believe in you, you know, I, I don't believe in what you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Um, let me give you one example that just happened, you know, in the past two or three days. 
this guy, I invited him to speak at one of our events like two years ago. And, you know, he said no with a lot of blah, blah in the, in the email. Then two days ago, somebody who is speaking at this conference connected me with him. He didn't know that we had a previous exchange two years ago. He connected me with him and he told him like, you know, this conference is great. You should speak here. And the guy said, Enrique, you know, I would love to speak in the event. And I was thinking, I remember that guy. So I went back to all my emails because I did. I remember that I had seen that name. Um, I went back to all the emails and I looked at the reasons why he said no. And they were, you know, maybe if you read between lines, it was a little bit insulting. And, and I said, you know what? Why would I want to have somebody, you know? I mean, I understand that somebody says no because they can't. But when you say no, because you don't believe in what somebody's doing, that feels a little, you know, kind of insulting, right? Um, so I've gotten a lot of those kinds, kinds of no's in life in general, you know, with sponsors, you know, the no's that are like, you know, you don't, you're not giving me what I want or this event is not what I, uh, I'm looking for. Um, to me, all becomes a lesson. You know, to me, it is, it is heartbreaking. So I'm not going to tell you, don't be heartbroken. That's BS, right? Uh, how can I say bad words here, by the way? I, I apologize if I say any, any bad words. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of BS, if you, if you think about it. You know, if, to tell somebody not to feel heartbroken about something. It's okay if you are heartbroken when you get a no. If you really wanted a job and you are told no, you know, you're going to be depressed and that's okay. You're going to be sad and that's okay. You're going to be heartbroken and that's okay. But you got to get yourself up from there, learn what happened and then move on to the next thing by doing better from the, from the reasons that you know you were, you were told no. So what I'm saying here is that even though it's okay to be heartbroken about something, what is not okay is to remain, to dwell in that place forever because you're making yourself a gigantic disservice because the person who said no to you, they don't care. I mean, they are not just like thinking, oh my God, I'm so heartbroken because I said no to Enrique. They don't, you know, maybe they care, but they don't even think about it. The one that is, could be dwelling in there is you and that will be a gigantic disservice to yourself. So my big message here is, you're going to get no's that are genuine no's. Enrique, you know, thank you so much. I'm not available or I'm not interested or this or that. You're going to get some other no's that are a little bit more painful, you know, to, to absorb, if you will. And that's okay. You know, feel the pain and then say, why did this person say, say no to me? Oh, they said no to me, like in the sponsor's case, because they wanted some data that I am not collecting from the participants. Okay, now I have to be better for the next one. Or because they wanted me to, you know, uh, um, I don't know, do this or that other thing for the event that it wouldn't have cost me anything to do it. It's just that I didn't know at the beginning. So I know already how to make it better for next one. So don't dwell in the brokenness or in the pain or in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fact that somebody told you no, grow from there grow mm -hmm. from there so it, to me it's a combination of uh, this sucks but then moving on to all right it sucks but it's making me better and i'm already i'm already preparing the conference for 2022 so at least mentally and and what happens is that as i get all these no's from speakers and sponsors mentally i'm already creating all the um sort of all the structure to respond to those no's and then go back to them and say, at least for the sponsors, and go back to them and say, hey, do you remember when I told you to be a sponsor last year and you said no for this? I already fixed it and made it way better so that you become a sponsor. So anyway, that's a, that's a little bit in there. Wow, Erika, that is so powerful. We have a couple of comments here. Temisa Kwe says, wow, about 10% acceptance. Lesson for me, never allow multiple rejections make you lose your focus. Yeah. Bukwala also states, no's can be heartbreaking but it makes me more determined to get it done. That is switching it all over. Thank you, Bukola. What is meant for me will be just focus. Great lesson. Thank you so much. We have Emmanuel Michael. Is I think he's also been a hey. multi-year speaker on the Hacking HR. Yeah, good platform. friend. I don't, I don't see here. him there. He's here. Ian he is here. And Yemi too. Yemi yeah. somewhere over there. Yes. Ian. Erika would like you to say hi. <laughs> okay. Em, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear. <laughs> oh, great. Hello. <laughs> uh, oh. Hi, Erika. How are you doing? How are you, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. 
I'm good. Good to see. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Yes. Thank you, Ian, for taking okay. out some time. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we have a question from Michael Imomo. It reads, have you ever doubted or dwindled in your passion or love for HR? And how did you rek rekindle it? Oh, yeah. Like every day it happens to me at least one time a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it happens. You know, it happens. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think, um, boy, I should have stayed in engineering. <laughs> um, but then it's, the, you know, but the, it, it happens. You know, it is like... Um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's okay. You know, to be to be in that place of 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 um, it, no, it's I, I don't want to say that it's okay. And you know, by telling you that okay, go there, but it's natural. It's human to be in that place of of, of hesitation and doubt, and you know, sometimes you know, self doubt and even you know, borderline with self deprecation. You know, sometimes it is like. Oh man, you know what? I'm not good enough to do this. You know, I'm I'm like you know like that's that you know I'm 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 like I really suck at doing this, right? And that that thinking, I mean, it doesn't come every day, but it comes. Uh, and sometimes I manage it pretty quickly. Sometimes it takes me a little bit more time because of something may have happened. Uh, but to me, it's always like when 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 what I try to to t bring back to my mind is the the end goal of what I'm trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when I think about my, myself, um, I'm, I'm not trying to, to, you know, to be a millionaire. Um, what I'm trying to do is to leave a legacy, right? And, and the day that I am not here anymore, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want people to say, when Ricky died, he had all this money in the bank account. I want people to say, when Ricky died, you know, he worked for, you know, 40 years to create a better HR. And this is how much better we are because of the work that he did. Uh, so to me, it's more about the impact and the legacy. And that's because that, that milepost is always moving. Uh, you know, the more you do, the further it gets because you want to even do it better than before. That keeps me really inspired when I go through moments of self-doubt uh, and uh, self-deprecation or uh, hesitation. So it's, it's human to be in a place like that. Uh, it's human to be feeling, uh, you know, something along those lines, what, what would suck. And, uh, you know, again, as I said before, what, what, um, what doesn't really work is for you to stay there, right? It, it is for, it is for you to, uh, you know, to be in that place all the time. Uh, you know, you got to move on from there. I know there are, there are people who take a little bit more time to move out from there. Sometimes they cannot do it by themselves. And if that's your case, if you are in a place of pain, if you're in a place of self-doubt, hesitation, and you cannot find the way out, look for a friend, look for your community uh, of support. I want to share this story with you with, um, it's, a, it's a fable um, from um, one of my favorite shows. I don't know if you've seen, it. it's called The West Wing. Um, it's, a, it's a show from like 20 years ago. So the story goes like this, you know, there's a guy walking on the street and he falls down a big hole. The guy tries to get out of the hole and he can't. So he starts yelling, help me, help me, help me. So there's a doctor passing by and the guy, and he hears the guy and the doctor writes a prescription and throws it into the hole. And the guy's like, well, this is not good enough and continues yelling, help me, help me, help me. There's a priest going by and he writes down a prayer and throws it into the hole. And the guy says, well, you know, this is not really help me. Help me, help me, help me. So there's a friend coming by and he hears the guy, sees him down the hole and he jumps in the hole. And the guy that was in the hole before says, like, are you stupid? What are you doing here? How are you going to help me out? The other guy says, yeah, I've been here before and I know the way out. Mm. So what I'm saying is that wow. there are people who have been in a hole uh, in a time of hesitation or depression or pain or brokenness, like we all have. And some of them have gotten out of it either by themselves or with the help of others. But if you can't get out of that hole by yourself, just look for that friend, you know, look for that community of support and they will, they will pull you out either by jumping in and getting you out or by just like throwing a rope and, you know, pulling you out of that hole, but, you know, rely on your community of support. That's really important. Wow. And that, that is so powerful. I mean, as you were sharing that story, I just remembered the, the vision behind my HR storybook, which is us putting up 
putting out our own stories. I mean, our high moments, our low moments, our struggles, our challenges, you know, and just to help other people come out of that hole, just in case they might be in that hole experiencing some form of obstruction or challenge. And that is really powerful. I think that community of support really goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, Lara, Lara, and I wanna, I wanna add something, and I know it's among the questions that you sent me. Sure. You, 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 one of the questions that you had sent me was, you know, what do you, what is the, what is the best HR that, that you dream about, right? Or, you know, something along those lines. And, and, and what I think about is, is an HR that is capable of doing the job while at the same time looking for those that are in the hole that are either screaming for help or they're just quiet sitting on the hole, having given up on themselves. Imagine that. Imagine walking down a road where you have all these holes and there are people yelling and screaming for help and you help them because you're passionate about people. But there are people down the hole and they're just sitting down in there and they just gave up on themselves. You know, they are like, I'm never going to get out of this. They are depressed or frustrated or they never, they don't think that they will ever progress professionally because they don't get the promotion or, or the job they want or whatever it is. So as HR professionals, we got to be that friend that is not only jumping into the hole and helping people out or just throwing the rope and helping them out. But at the same time, we have to be very aware of the ones that are not screaming for help but they still are down the hole. And those are the harder, the harder ones to see, right? Because they, we, don't, we don't necessarily know. But if you talk to people, if you build human relationships at work beyond the specifics of your job and the specifics of the transactions that you're doing, if you build those human relationships by talking to people, you will know. You will, you will get to understand like, you know what? This person sounds like it's going through something hard. So maybe I'm going to need to offer a little bit of extra rope in here, you know, to, to provide more support to this person. That to me is a truly ideal HR. Yes, for me, I think that also relates to what I had mentioned earlier about my, my, my dream is to have transformative HR as change agents. And for me, it goes beyond just being yeah. a day-to-day -day transactional HR or just even being a strategic HR, but being a human-centered HR who understands how to harness the talents of people I mean, so it's not just getting your talent to deliver on, on the business imperatives, but it's also understanding, discovering your talent yeah. and then helping to unnest, you know, their inner strengths so they can bring their best whole self to work. So yeah. it's having talent that is emotionally balanced, physically balanced, you know, and they, they, they feel great coming to work. I yeah. mean, they find the organization as a great place to be. It's not yeah. just all about the structure of the policies that we all put in place for our talents within our organization, yeah. but giving them that meaning, helping them to find purpose, helping them to find connection to the things that they have to do at work. And that really does go a long way. Thank you, yeah. Eric, for, for sharing that. So that I have a question here from Jay Stage Reads. Based on the data, that Nigeria tops the third countries that attend the conference. Is there a post follow-up session that helps keep participants charged up even after the session? Just, just as we know, events can be a one-off that participants can all get fired up within that period of the conference. Then weeks and months later, it seems like business as usual. Then, yeah. then we need to refill, just like we have my HR storybook, da -da -da, serving as reminder or guide, da -da -da, just talking, asking about your post-event activities. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because it's not it's not necessarily weeks or months later, it's even days later, you know, I mean, or even the day after, you know, the, the one challenge that I um, that I see with this, all this, um, you know, online events or events in general, is that people get fired up only to go back to work the day after the conference to do the same thing that they were doing before the conference. And this is what I tell people, whatever happens through the conference or after the conference it is all up to you to make the changes, to do things differently. If you come to a conference and you invest, you know, 40 hours, 30 hours, 25 hours of learning time in that conference, only to be the same person the day after the conference that you were before the conference, then it would have been better just to not be part of the conference, right? It is, it is up to everybody here to make sure that out of all the hours of content you say in this panel of one hour, 
this one thing that this person said, I'm going to do it because I know I can do it. I know, you know, you're going to be hearing from people from different companies, different countries, different things, and not everything will be applicable to you, but some things will be. So those are the things that you got to say, I can make this happen. How can I make it happen in my, in my organization, in my role, in my country? So, so I'm, I'm putting a lot of responsibility on you, of course, to, you know, to, uh, to follow through all the things that you're learning. But going to the more specific question about what we're going to be doing after, this year we're putting out an amazing learning agenda. You know, every month we're covering a different theme. So just, you know, sign up for the conference because as you sign up for the conference, I'm adding you to our newsletter and you're going to be getting more information about it. It's, 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 um, it's not necessarily part of the conference, but it's a continued converse, a continued conversation uh, about you know elevating uh, HR. So it's two parts of it: what we're doing, but also your, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, you know unchangeable and um, uh, uh, untransferable uh, responsibility with yourself to 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 follow through what you're learning in the conference. And just to also add to that, I, I get your newsletters. I mean, almost every week at work. And I've, I've found that to be like a reference guide. So sometimes I'm in the middle of work, I need, to, I need to remember something, I just go and search for Hacking HR. And a lot of resource material pops up. I also know that you have a community where people can chat and reach out and network even after the, the conference. So there's a whole lot that you, you've put in place. And thanks, yeah. Jason, for, 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 bringing that, for bringing that up. Okay, I have a question here from Felix. It reads, how do you manage this conference with a huge number of speakers and yet maintain your focus? <laughs> uh, great and you've question. Done it, you've done it consistently. I, I mean, uh, I think it's, what year are we now? I'm still counting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, I, it's, uh, we are about, you know, five, uh, a little over 500 speakers. But let me tell you just, just today, you know, today is Sunday, just today, my emails about the conference. Let me show you. Uh, Enrique, I have not, this is a moderator. I have not heard from these speakers. Can you reach out to them? Enrique, I have a surgery the day of my conference. Can you switch me up to another panel? Enrique, can you please change the name of the, the title of the panel? Because it doesn't make sense, the name that we have before, even though this person has been in that panel like for months. Um, so, and there were like two or three other emails, a uh, 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 LinkedIn messages. So every day it is, you know, Things like that, they, they are small, you know, because at the end of the day, changing the name of a, of a panel, it, it was just a minor change. It's a small, but it takes a lot of time to change all the banners, all the event guides and everything, right? So uh, it's hard. It's hard to keep focus when there's so much transaction uh, going on. But to me, what keeps me inspired, even when I get sometimes upset at these things, you know, because sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I have to do that now. Um, sometimes it is like, you know, no, nobody, nobody is forcing me to do this. You know, I, 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 I could say after this, I'm quitting, but I'm not. Uh, so because nobody's forcing me to do this, what keeps me grounded in reality and keeps me focused is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. Because, you know, I'm doing this and getting closer to the conference, I'm going to be getting 50 messages every day of people saying, I cannot find this. Where is my moderator? Where is the material? I, you know, the banner has a typo, things of the kind, but Hey, you know, I decided to do it. Um, so, so that's, a, that's, I think, uh, how I, how I keep, um, how I try to keep focused on, on the, uh, um, you know, while going through all this, you know, everyday details, it's, it's all about, um, it's all about keeping, keeping your mind, you know, focus on the price. Yeah. And your why. And the why, is, yeah, that's the why, yeah. yeah. Which is the core of what yep. you're doing. Awesome. Well, I, I imagine how, how do you cope? Do you get to sleep given the fact yeah. that they have people from different time zones? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard having, you know, I have people from, you know, we have people from India, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Nigeria, of course. We got people from, um, somebody from Egypt, uh, we got people, a lot of people from Europe, a lot of people from the, from the American continent, you know, um, uh, you know, what is the, uh, we, I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking, I, I was talking to somebody from Bali, you know, they may be joining the conference, somebody from Bali, I never met anybody from Bali before, and, you know, um, it's, 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 you know, it's fun, you know, it's, uh, it's fun, and I get to talk to all these people, and I get to learn so much. 
it is just wonderful how similar we are. You know, like we live in different countries. Our native languages are different, you know, um, our religions, our, you know, but we are so similar at the end of the day. It's just fascinating to see that we are just a bunch of human uh, humans just trying to learn and progress, right? I mean, it's just wow. beautiful, to be honest, yeah. Okay, I have one question here. What is your dream for HR 20 years from now? Um, my dream for HR 20 years from now, I think that's a little bit far down the road. I, I'm going to say, you know, um, five years from now, even, you know, nine, nine years from now, by the year 2030, I am hoping that what we're doing at work is building relationships and helping people thrive, find meaning, purpose, mm. uh, be happy at work. And that all the transactions mm. that we have to do, I mean, we minimize that. We transfer some of that to technology. We continue doing some of the transaction, but that our, you know, that our 80%, the 80% of our time is dedicated to, to truly creating a workplace where people thrive, flourish, grow, and are happy. Mm. So that to me is what I dream about HR. Uh, we, we got a huge gap to get there. You know, we, we got to yeah. do a lot of work because it sounds pretty easy, but it's not. Um, you know, it sounds like, oh yeah, you know, let's make people happy. Yeah, but then you have to, you know, how do you transfer the, the concept of happiness into a nature process and then connect that to the business outcomes, right? So so that understanding takes time, but that to me is the ideal state for, state for HR. It is how can we create a function that helps the business achieve the goals through the work that we do with people by also helping them thrive, flourish, grow, and be happy. Awesome. So we, we, need, we, we, are, we, are, we are that connector that brings that win-win balance. Yep. The organization and of course the people ensuring that they are their optimal best at all yep. time, at the same time delivering on the business um, objectives and KPIs. Awesome, yep. fantastic. What, what's, uh, what's, what's funny, Lara, is that for too long, we, we disconnected human, uh, human advancement, human happiness and joy and progress and growth from the achievement of business goals. That is the stupidest thing that we could have ever done in the world of organizations. If you have somebody who is unhappy, stressed, frustrated, do you think they are giving their best at work? The answer is simply no. You're paying them, but you're not getting the best out of them because the hmm. best of them is not being, you know, um, optimized, sort of optimized, leveraged, encouraged at work. So to have this connected, these two things, because we were so focused on squeezing people to the bones just to make the most money out of them. And we disconnected that from the, from the, from the purpose of humanity and human connections and whatnot. That was stupid, right? And, and I think we got to go back to that. We got to say, you know what? If this person is finding meaning at work, purpose at work, if this person is having joy at work, if this person is um, growing and thriving, I am sure that they will give their best to the company that they work for, therefore the company will do better by providing those opportunities to them. So that if we can find that connection and we can, but we have to learn how, you know, we are going to be in a much better shape than just, you know, squeezing people to the bones and, and you know, just thinking of them as resources and not as humans. Absolutely. And that takes me to my next question, Enrique. So you had mentioned earlier when you talked about the evolution of human resources. I mean, over the years, we've all just been taught to hire and fire, then do a lot of administrative work, then transition to strategic. But now we are talking about human-centered focused HR. And how do you think we can evolve individually as HR professionals, given the fact that we need to be able to create that win-win balance to ensure that the people that come to our organization are at their optimal best. I mean, a lot of us went to business school or some of us even took, um, um, some of us have backgrounds in either basic science or art or commercial. We do not have, we, did, we have not learned those skills on how to be more human-centered HR professional, but yet, 
the world is demanding that from us. Our organization yeah. is demanding, our people are demanding that for us. How do we learn the skills and competences? Um, well, I, I, I want to say this um, about that. Um, <laughs> It, it, it may sound um, it may sound a little harsh, but you know I'm still gonna share it. You you have to be the one betting on yourself. Hmm. You have to be the one investing on yourself. Hmm. Nobody else will do it for you. Let me put it this way: if you have a boss, a leader in your company that is investing in you, that's fantastic. But then you are in the minority because most likely you're gonna find a workplace where your growth will always be equated to what makes sense for the organization and not necessarily what makes sense for you individually in your career. So you have to bet on yourself. You have to invest on yourself. And what I mean by that is you got to own your career progression and you got to find the ways to continue to learn beyond work. People talk about stability. Um, you know, people talk about stability at work these days. There is no stability in work anymore. Look at what happened last year. I think it was something along the lines of 10%. I think it's actually more. I think the World Economic Forum posted the, uh, the, uh, the number. I can't remember if it was 10% or something along those lines of the entire a global workforce lost their jobs after COVID. So there's no stability anymore at job. Now, your best approach to stability now comes with a concept that I call employability. And your employability is how, how employable you are for a company, right? Hmm. So... Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that you do as much as possible to own your own career, to own your own progression, to invest in yourself, sit on the driver's seat, make sure that if your company is not investing in you, well, you know, that's part of the brokenness that I was talking about before. It sucks that they are not investing in you, but you cannot be just, you know, staying stagnant because they are not investing in you, you have to invest in yourself. Because if tomorrow, and this is very harsh, because if tomorrow they fire you and you try to find another job, you will never be able to say to another company, I didn't grow professionally because the company that I worked before didn't invest in me. You won't be able to say that. So as a nature professional, you will learn on the job, of course. Hopefully your company is giving you opportunities for growth. But at the same time, my main message here is on your career progression. And in this day and age, there really, there really isn't an excuse not to learn. Let me give you an example of that. Do you want to learn about people analytics, for example? You don't have to pay $1,000 for a course. I mean, you may want to do if you have the money, but if you don't have the money, you go to YouTube, you go to LinkedIn, you go to the Hacking Nature Conference, and then you get all these resources for free that can give you the idea on how to do this. If you want to learn about diversity, inclusion, equity, and analytics in that space, you get a ton of resources to be able to do that. So there's no excuse not to learn today. Anyway, my main message here is your professional growth, in my view, fully depends on you. And there are several opportunities out there that you can find for your own growth. So see it really sit in the driver's seat. Time for excuses, that's over. That's the past. Now is the time for action. It's the time for self-driven learning and for you to really, really, really invest in yourself. Wow. I mean, you said it all. It's time for us to take ownership of our career. It's no longer waiting for your organization to set your developmental plan mm -hmm. for yourself. Correct. But you own and set your developmental plan for yourself. Fantastic. Wow. That was really, really profound. Thank you, Enrique. I think I have one or two more questions here. Sure. So I have a question here from Tiami. What threat is human resource management exposed to in the artificial intelligence era? Will human resource management be totally substituted with machine learning? 
Sorry, I, I, I think I, I got a little lost in that question. What what trait? What trait? What trait? Trait is HRM oh. exposed to in the artificial intelligence era, and will human resource management be totally substituted with machine hmm. learning? Ooh, that's a that's a good one. I think that um, you know whenever you see a transaction that costs a lot of money, but it's the same thing day in and day out. That one piece can give you a good idea that something can be automated with technology, of course. Um, let me give you one example. Um, reviewing, filtering resumes, you know, filtering resumes for a job posting. That's a, that's a time consuming job that may seem very transactional if what you're doing in the first level of a screening is just looking for some basics. And then you're saying this person doesn't have the basic, you know, not, not uh, for the job. This person has some of the basic, probably for the job. So you have a first screening, right, in that recruitment process. And I'm using this as an example. You have a first screening. Time consuming, very transactional. That gives you a good idea that it's very possible that um, that piece of your work could be automated. Now, will be automated tomorrow, today, uh, in uh, five years from now? I don't know. But that piece of your work can be automated. Uh, you know, the person who is working in a, um, you know, call center for a company, right? If you're working in a call center and what you're doing is responding questions that are questions that people are asking, but they can be found in a handbook or, or something, that's time consuming, it's expensive, but it's transactional. That can be done by technology, a chatbot. You know, somebody asking in a chat, uh, like today, you know, the banks, they don't have people like before, you know, that you call and the first person that is picking up the phone is a human. That's not happening anymore. You go through all this machine, trying to respond to your questions before they move you on to a human. So that gives you a good idea of what could be automated. But the reality at the end of the day is this. There will be jobs that will be fully replaced by technology. But the jobs that will, will not be fully replaced by technology will still be very much impacted by technology. Every job in the world will be impacted by technology. Uh, in what way? When you know that's part of that's part of this uh, thinking that you have to do about what is the transaction that you're running and what is truly delivering value, and hopefully you continue to do more of what truly delivers value instead of just a transaction. That was a sort of a long answer with a, you know, a lot of moving pieces in there. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think you've just been able to bring everything home. And that calls for innovative thinking for HR professionals. So even though sometimes we get, we might have to automate some of our work, it doesn't entirely take away the fact that there will be humans needed to manage and run you know, the execution of that transaction has been automated. Thanks so much for that. Um, there's a lot of comments around uh, your, your, <laughs> your response on self-development and uh, everyone is accepting to, and alluded to the fact that yes, we need to own our career. We need to, we need to take more responsibility in developing ourselves. And I would also like to say that even in Nigeria here, we have a lot of senior professionals who have come up with a lot of initiative around helping young people to build capacity. Mm -hmm. I have on this call, Taiwo Diabato, who is also um, a highly respected HR professional, passionate about helping young ones develop themselves. I have Yemi Fashion one as well. I have Emmanuel Michael. We have Benga Totoyi, Twins, my a whole lot of them. So thank you so much. This this has, as a reminder, I mean, for a lot of people here on the need for us to go out of our way, invest in yourself. Mm. I always share my story. I got my job into Accenture because I'd, I'd self-taught myself on how to use Excel. When Accenture needed an HR analyst, to be hired so many years ago. Okay, sorry about that interference, yes. Okay, so I, I, had to, I had to learn Excel on my own. And when there was a need for an HR analyst with an Excel skill, I, I was contacted and I 
I passed my assessment just based on Excel. And over the years, I've also had to evolve from just understanding Excel to understanding data analytics, right? Because I, I understand the trend. So my point is, as you're developing new skills, understand the trends, understand the yeah. time. So whatever you're developing is in alignment with what is in what is in the trend currently. I mean, as it, as as what evolves, you can't be developing skills that are no longer relevant. So you need to do your research, and you also need to be aware of current trends, even within your organization. Where is the organization going the next? two, three, four, five years, begin to position yourself by learning skills that will make you relevant to that organization in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Erike. That is um, correct. Any, yes, any, any, any one or two more questions? Okay. And um, to, also talk, to also talk about how we are working in Nigeria to build um, a capacity knowledge environment, we have with us the CEO of our Human Resource Institute, CIPM, you know, right in the midst of us, who is also really passionate about helping young ones and even professionals, you know. To <laughs> Sorry, there's some. Okay. Somebody is like, I'm muting. Yes, uh, yes. I think that now is better. You're, you're muted, uh, Lara, you're muted too. Okay, okay, you have to, you have to mute everyone. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Yes, I was, I was talking about our, our institute in Nigeria, which focused on helping human resource professionals to build capacity called CIPM. It's a great institute that also um, encourages human resource professionals to be um, top-notch global professionals. So in that institute, we learn a, a lot around the right capability that we need to have, the right knowledge that we need to have is our, our apex Institute for Human Resource Professionals in Nigeria. And we have in our midst our CEO, Ms. Busola Lofe, who is really so passionate around ensuring that HR professionals were equipped to stay relevant um, for, for the future. I mean, when we talk about the future, the future starts from now. So there's a whole lot that is going on within Nigeria here. And I'm happy that that is also being reflected in your conference as having Nigerians as the third highest um, <laughs> participants to register for your conference. It talks about our nature um, and our behavior and uh, uh, the fact that we all yearn to learn in Nigeria. And we are so happy, we are so grateful to have you also spend some time on a Sunday morning from your location to equally, <laughs> come, and, to equally come, and, come and share with us here. Thank you so much. Okay. By, 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 by the way, I know a couple of things about Nigeria. Um, okay, tell me. Uh, you know, I when, when we did the first event in Nigeria, which may have been a couple of years ago, um, I, I learned two things that I that were very mind blowing. The first one is, or very interesting actually. The first one is, and this was pre-COVID, by the way. I don't know how COVID is impacting this, but this was pre-COVID. That by the year 2030, it was expected that Nigeria was going to be the 21st global economy, and I think the first one in the African continent with something in the trillions of dollars in GDP. And the second one, which is really, really mind blowing, was that Lagos uh, was going to become the most, it's going to become the most populated city uh, in the world by the year 2100, which sounds pretty far. But that's not going to happen in 2100. It's, gonna, it's happening right now. Yeah. And the city will probably have around 100 million people. So you may say like, well, you know, we're, we're, I don't think any of us will be around here in the year 2100. And, you know, if we, 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 we we'll be lucky if we are. But the reality is that, you know, the preparation for what's going to happen in the long term, 
you know, it's, it starts from today. And, you know, don't, don't think about the year 2100, but think about the year 2022, 2025, 2030. What do you want your cities, your country to be? What kind of talent do you need? What don't you have? Start making connections. You know, if you say, you know what, you know, in Nigeria, it seems that we have a lot of technology companies, which is true, by the way, um, you know, operating in the Nigerian ecosystem. But we don't have enough people who know about, say, um, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, going back to that example. So that means two things. We got to cultivate that talent in Nigeria. But in the meantime, we got to get help from people that are not in Nigeria to help us cultivate that talent. So in looking forward to what you know, the direction in which your country is going to, you start thinking, where do I have to go to find talent for artificial intelligence professionals? What school in Nigeria do I partner with to say, you know what, we are a company and we want to invest some money into uh, training the next generation of AI engineers uh, that are from Nigeria so that they work in Nigerian companies. So that's what I mean by adding value and not just running the transaction. You work for, for a company and then you tell your boss, uh, the president of the company, hey, you know, it seems that our industry will be going through these changes in the next five years. But you know what? You know, Lara, you're the president of the company. You know, it seems that we're going to need artificial intelligence engineers. And the pool in Nigeria is really small. So I'm making a plan for how to get artificial intelligence engineers for the next five years, you know, for this company. That Mm -hmm. makes you way more valuable and relevant than reacting to that in the moment that is needed instead of in the moment that you can plan it. So, you know, just an idea about things to think about. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that, 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 that was spot on. So it of course ties back to what I had talked about earlier in terms of understanding the trends. When I talk about the trends, it's not just within your organization, but of course understanding the old socioeconomic trends as well and what the opportunities yeah. are for, for us here in Nigeria. Yeah. Thank you. Let me check if there's one or more questions. I think, wow, we've been, <laughs> we've been on for an hour and a half. Thank you so much, Erike. So in what would be your parting word to professionals in Nigeria as we wrap up your session? Um, I, I would say perhaps, you know, based on what we talked about today is number one, believe in yourself. And by that, what I mean is that when you believe in yourself, it doesn't mean that you won't fail. It doesn't mean that you won't hesitate. It doesn't mean that you will never have doubts on your own capacities because you will still have all those things. But it means that you will either by yourself or with the help of somebody else, you you will get out of that hole of self-doubt, hesitation, deprecation, or uh, or brokenness. So if you fail, if you get a no, um, if you have some level of hardship right now, whether it is health, financial, professional hardship, you know, those things happen to everybody. And if you are able to believe in yourself, you, you will be able to, to get out of there, move on from there and do better, whatever you weren't doing before getting into that hole. If you still believe in yourself, but you don't know how to get out of there, just ask for help. You know, mm-hmm. get, get, get together with your community of support, with your friends, with the you know, professional network and ask for help. You know, I mean, you, you may be surprised of how many people out there have gone through the same thing that you're going through and they are pretty down to helping you out. So believe in yourself. And the second thing is, of course, invest in yourself. Believe in your, to believe in yourself, to truly achieve the promise of believing in yourself, you have to invest in yourself. Because believing that you can do something without investing in the skills that you need to actually make it happen is it's setting yourself up for failure again, even if you believe in yourself. So believing in yourself is saying, I I can do this. I know I can make it happen. I need to learn how to make it happen. So invest in your own progress, in your own uh, professional development, in your own growth and learning. Because if you have somebody who is doing it for you, fantastic, but most likely nobody else will do it for you. So believe in yourself and invest in yourself. Those are the two things that I think um, I would love for you to uh, walk away with. 
Wow, 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 wow. That, that is so profound. And I'd like to add to what you talked about with regards to investing in yourself. So for me, investing in yourself is not just all about learning, but of course, also volunteering. You know, volunteering to take up um, other activities, being in a place of service. I mean, so sometimes when we talk about come and volunteer for an activity, we see it from a perspective of, oh, I might not have time for this. But we don't look at the other benefit that might also come out of investing or in or sort of giving of yourself or of your time to be of service to a particular cause. There's there's a huge opportunity for us to invest when we when we are of service, you know, to to other uh, um, to join other people in in supporting or in, in or in assisting them. Very very recently, there was a project going on in my organization, and I offered it was project management based and I offered to be part of the activity. It was a non-HR activity anyway, but I went out of my way because I realized I would learn more about my business when yeah. I support and when I volunteer my time, it was going to cost me a bit more extra time to stay, to stay awake and read and study or to whatever work on the project. But at the end of the day, I learned project management skills I was able to further deepen and harness my change management skills. And from there as well, I also took up, you know, business analysis knowledge and I started learning in that area. So in the place of service and volunteering, so you get to invest in yourself. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. That was a very powerful, powerful session. Um, to wrap this up, we have just two more activities. One is, we are celebrating our one year anniversary um, for my HR storybook. Like I'd mentioned earlier, it's not just about me, but it's about the entire 56 HR professionals that have put together, um, you know, their story out there to impact the world. So we have like a very short video. I'm hoping that the video is ready. Patience, can you just share that video? Patience, are you, are you ready? Patience, are you on the call? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you more. Sorry, I can hear you. All right, please. Can you go ahead? Okay. Hi, patients. I'm, I'm, I'm coming, ma'am, sorry. Okay. So basically, it's also just to acknowledge the other professionals that have shared their stories with, in the book. Um, okay. Some of them are on the call today. Some of them are not here. We celebrate every one of them. Can you smile?
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, patience, for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. On that note, we would like to wrap up today's session. Um, we'll have with us one of our contributors to the HR Storybook who would like to give the vote of thanks on behalf of my HR Storybook team. So can I please have Tony Ismail to please come up stage and give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mahil, are you there? She seems to be muted. Okay, Tony, are you on me? Okay. Tony, we can't hear you, Tony. You're mute? I think you have to you have to mute it, Lara. Oh. Okay. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Um, great to be here, to be sharing with like minds. Enrique, I would like to say a very big thank you on behalf of all of us. This evening has really been about you bringing your authentic self to bear here. You know, it wasn't about, oh, see me, I've done a great job, I'm so successful. You have shown us what we already know, you, or rather you have validated some of the things we have been told over time, that these th things take time. There's a process you need to go through. And you have taken us through your process. You have shared your own authentic story with us. We're very happy for that. We're very happy that you validated the fact that we can fail happily, you know, because only then do we learn and begin to do things better. I think one of the great things you really challenged us with, you know, is this whole sense of purpose. I mean, with the conference as huge as HR hacking, some people wouldn't believe you're not making money. They'll probably just count the number of participants, $100, $200, and think, wow, this guy must be going home smiling, you know? And that's purpose. Every other thing just fades. You look at your objective and you're driven by that. And I like, I also like it because it shows us that in our own little spaces, we can all do something. It wasn't huge when you started, but you know, it's become something. And there's so many lives that have been impacted by this. I really like that. Lastly, I like your charge. And I really like the, if you don't believe in yourself, you won't invest in yourself. So the beliefs really starts with you. Lara talks a lot about your mindset. You know, having that mindset change, that imposter syndrome follows everyone around. And I think the way we choose to react to it would determine how much value we place on ourselves and what it is that we know. So on behalf of everybody, I would like to say a huge thank you for taking our time this evening to be with us. I would like to thank all the contributors on this call today. Without you, Lara's HR storybook may have been her story, her daddy's story, her mommy's story, her brother's story. But you know, you've all brought in your own unique stories and it has made it richer. Thank you very much. To everyone who's been with us for the last one and a half hours, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. You know, I was here just jotting down, you know, based on things people had said and questions people had have asked. It's made it so rich and such a wonderful way to spend the evening. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. See you all at the HR Hacking Conference. Conference, yes. It is something of us are going to be at the conference. So look out for us, Enrique. Absolutely. <laughs> I will do. Thank you. <laughs> and patience. Thank you. Thank you for always being a gem. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Enrique. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Everyone. And have a productive week. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Can you unmute and just say thank you to Enrique? Let him hear our, our Nigerian voice. <laughs> <laughs> our Nigerian voice. Can you please unmute? I think you have to unmute them, uh, Lara. Okay. Oh, guys, sorry. I uh, need to unmute everyone. Um, okay. Yes, guys, so please.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Have a productive week. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. 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 Thank you, Clara.